Hi everybody, my name is Susie Dawson. I'm an activist, a journalist, and the president of the Internet Party of New Zealand. I am continuing here the Unity 4J online vigil for Julian Assange um, under hashtag protect Julian, which has been trending in Ecuador, Australia, and the United States, thanks to you amazing people who've been circulating it. Um, I'm here with Don Dvar, and we have just noticed that there is now a big protest and a lot of chanting going on outside the Ecuadorian embassy in London. I'm going to put the link to the Rupchley feed, the Periscope, into the YouTube chat. Um, police are there on site. I don't believe that they're there to um, arrest Julian Assange. I believe they're there because there's now a large number of protesters on site and some very loud, spirited chanting of free Julian Assange, free Julian Assange. So yeah. check out the Periscope if you want to. I will copy that. Oh, somebody's just posted it. Thank you. That's very helpful. Arish Jamal, one of our other friendly independent journalists. Um, the police are quite passive, people are saying. But the protest is very spirited, which is good news for Julian. That's right. That's so, right. Don, can you introduce yourself? I'm, I'm sorry, I incorrectly said you're from San Francisco because I associate you with our friends <coughs> from Pacifica who are right. from San Francisco. But... Please take it away, introduce yourself, and tell us what your take is on the events of this week. Okay, well, first of all, what you're looking at behind me is uh, the scene through Ruptly, the uh, Russian television uh, uh, service, um, at uh, the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Julian Assange still is. Uh, as Susie said, there is a uh, protest, a very spirited protest, and apparently a very well-attended protest going on just around the corner from, from the shot that we're looking at, and that police have been dispatched there just now, um, we believe, uh, you know, to, for crowd maintenance. We don't know how that's going to play out yet. And, of course, crowd maintenance can be a euphemism for a lot of stuff that's pretty ugly. Um, the good news is, of course, number one, the plans to uh, eject Julian from the Ecuadorian embassy that were leaked or obtained a couple of days ago have apparently been thwarted by the uh, organization of people around the world um, in opposition to that. That in and of itself um, is uh, you know, an amazing uh, f uh, feat. It's a very encouraging one. It shows, even, uh, even if nothing else, uh, it's an indicia of how people really feel about their right to know that they're motivated to uh, turn out to demonstrate for it in such numbers ah, in the Don. face of a media campaign. Don, I'm yeah. so sorry to cut you off in the middle of your sentence. I've just been told it's not police at the embassy. It is the Yellow Vest UK have descended oh, upon no. the embassy oh, wow. to, protest, to protest what is happening to Julian. Uh-oh. Could the Yellow Vest be contagious? Oh, my goodness. Like That's it. even better. So, and, and, it, and it makes the point that I was making even more strongly, which is that, um, you know, people are being lit up on fire over the right to know, that they're being motivated to get out and defend the right to know. And, you know, the locus of that geographically right now on planet Earth, I mean, there are some, a few spots where Chelsea Manning is, there are people all over the planet. But Julian Assange is ground zero right now, the Ecuadorian embassy. That is something that, uh, happened because of the will of the Ecuadorian people at the time that uh, President Rafael Correa granted asylum to Julian Assange and the, the Ecuadorian government, by the way. And uh, we had some, you know, things happen in Ecuador over the last election uh, that uh, put Julian at high risk. To when Lenny, uh, Lenin Moreno, it makes me <clears throat> angry to actually call him Lenin, his first name, but uh, when the uh, U.S. puppet uh, was elected by people who believed they were electing uh, Correa's successor, uh, Julian was put at risk and uh, has been at risk you know, since. There have been a couple of these flare-ups where plans to uh, release him into the U.K., which is what happens if they push him out the door, uh, thereby into the waiting arms of the police that will be there and ready to ship him off to the United States or put him in a cell in, in the UK forever. Um, you know, we have seen several incidents of that where people have been uh, motivated to organize to stop it. 
Uh, that is building. This is the largest uh, effort that we've seen so far. Now, what Susie put together, for example, in a day of this um, marathon over the weekend, the number of people that are participating in this, uh, that all by itself is pretty remarkable. But on the ground, we, we now have the, ye the yellow vests of the UK on the ground outside of uh, the Ecuadorian embassies. This is a remarkable and a very positive uh, development, both on this particular issue the specific issue of Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks particular issue of, uh, you know, the right to know, uh, the right to leak, uh, the right to, uh, you know, actual honest information, uh, and uh, the larger uh, picture, which is, you know, a, a global democratic movement, a real democratic movement that uh, really needs to take place beginning in places like London, New York, Washington, and San Francisco. <laughs> So it, it's very encouraging what's, what's happening today. And I'm very happy uh, that you know we're here talking about something that's encouraging um, instead of uh, seeing uh, Julian taken off in uh, irons and uh, you know three reporters standing there with a little tape recorder saying, what do you think about this? Yeah, this looks like a real show of force from protesters, which yeah. is great. Yes, it great. is. Um, great to see. And yes, we've seen is. also um, throughout the month of December and January, there was a real um, increase, a, a it came to a crescendo also, almost, where we saw finally we penetrated and got some political support. Rather than just um, support of academics, journalists, whistleblowers, we had members of the German parliament, um, German members of parliament uh, advocating for Julian outside the Ecuadorian embassy we had an open letter, a declaration signed by um, several, maybe 36 or 40 members of the European Parliament as well. Um, we even saw Rudy Giuliani speaking yeah. out and saying Julian shouldn't have been prosecuted. What was your take on, on that? Well, look, all right, first of all, um, If you look at where people's interests lie, you know, very often it'll tell you uh, what lie they will tell. <laughs> um, in, in this particular, first of all, in this case, uh, 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 Giuliani is absolutely correct. It may be one of those broken clocks, you know, right twice a day cases or whatever. Um, but he is uh, the attorney for the president. Um, and... Uh, He's a former uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, uh, which is, carries with it uh, being charged with um, uh, defense of the Bill of Rights, regardless of what the person might believe themselves, what their political ambitions might have them say and or do. Uh, that is a job that uh, is a part of your job description that you have institutional mechanisms that are just practicing on their own while you're the U.S. attorney. So you get exposed to this on a daily, constant basis. Uh, so I, you know, I don't want to reach into his soul, so, so to speak, and figure out the, his motivations for it. But to Rudy Giuliani is also a very uh, bright lawyer, and he's absolutely correct uh, that Julian Assange should not be prosecuted. What is at issue here? And we don't even know about Julian Assange's particular uh, fingerprints. Um, it's not the you know trumped up. Uh, abuse, sexual abuse cases that have gone by the wayside now that they've had him on the run and they've been in the stalemate position for you know, these years. The real thing is that the real sin that was committed is the exposure of misdeeds, malfeasance, criminal activity, institutional, institutional criminal activity um, by uh, the U.S. government. That's the crime that he's committed. Now, there's no statute for that. Oh, ratting out crooked politicians shall bring a set, you know, a jail sentence of blah 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 and a fine of not more than twenty. They don't have a law for that. They just have, a, you know, a well-established practice that goes back to Torquemada and before them. You know, they could just as easily declare him a witch. They'd have the same, actually, a stronger legal basis to do that, and certainly an awful lot of uh, historical precedent. <laughs> Um, but Giuliani is right to say that because the real crime is that WikiLeaks somehow upset the 2016 election, which in turn uh, was based upon exposure 
of institutional criminal activity by Clinton at the Department of State and by uh, Clinton's foundation and by the Democratic National Committee. So that's the that's the sin that the half of the political institutions in the United States that you got a snapshot of, which believe me resembles the other half almost to the T, was completely and thoroughly crooked. And it was a, a massive record of this that was exposed. That's the crime. And so, you know, Giuliani's been in, in politics long enough that somewhere I'm sure there are a few me- pages of memos that with his name on them. Um, or maybe not. You know, some, some of these guys with the, the, you know, the Mussolini making the trains run on time uh, uh, bent, uh, some of them are actually clean in, in that sense. You know, they 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 get paid institutionally for their dirty work, or through some other way instead of slipped under the table, like we saw with Clinton and the DNC. Um, there are a lot of other people, though, of much more uh, interest to me <laughs> in terms of um, you know the validity of their opinion and the you know the basis from which they're critiquing things, uh, who have taken a stand, and a lot of them have been appearing here, journalists, uh, yourself, Margaret Kimberly. Uh, Joe Lauria, uh, Dimitri Babich. I loved seeing uh, Dimitri last night with um, Kubrick. I forgot her first name. Vivian. Um, yeah, Vivian, yeah. that was a great interview. That was a great interview. Great it certainly interview. was. And and this is a discussion that I've been having on and off with uh, Dimitri also. It's, it's like kind of his, the real work that he's doing re- revolves around the uh, the evolution of um, what, what was called liberal ideology in the West that he terms ultra liberal ideology um, and uh, into uh, totalitarian uh, ideology. In other words, and, and, and of course, <laughs> it had the same messianic, um, you know, underpinning when it was uh, in competition with the, uh, you know, with the Soviet bloc and, and, uh, and well, certainly with that. Um, that, you know, no man is free until all men are free. And this is how you're free. You set up a constitution model on the United States Constitution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, pretty much until uh, very recently, there was uh, both a strong belief and supported by practice um, that uh, this had been accomplished, that with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 and uh, the changes in uh, uh, China after Mao and then after Deng, um, that uh, you know the U.S. and uh, EU or and or Japan, whatever the and South Korea, whatever that construct is, Western uh, imperialism um, had had one that was was now the global hegemon and could dictate uh, to the four corners of the planet. It, that is something that the so-called totalitarian government and the so-called totalitarian Soviet bloc never aspired to. They, they didn't have uh, the uh, infrastructure established to accomplish that. God, God help us if they, if they had. Um, you know, when we were fighting against the war back in the late 60s and early 70s, for example, in Vietnam, that particular war, um, it wasn't like we could go to the Soviet embassy and say, look, you know, we need $100,000 so we can buy advertising for television. And well, There was none of that. Not like the United States dropping $5 billion into Ukraine for a coup. So this actual ideology that was juxtaposed against, uh, you know, Communist Party ideology, this, you know, Marxist ideology around the world, prevailed in terms of acquiring real estate and, you know, and, and uh, uh, jurisdiction over real estate and, and has, you know, made itself... Uh, more and more, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a merit, a, a, an actual expression of a totalitarian ideology. There is very little tolerance of uh, dissent from this line. If you talk to people who will tell you they're of the left, <clears throat> excuse me, some will call themselves communists, socialists, uh, leftists, Marxists. Um, Democrats, <laughs> um, whatever, uh, 
and there's some things you can't say. You can't even raise, as, you know, for discussion. Even set up as a straw man and, and knock down in an argument, there are heresies that are just not spoken. You know, these are things that are sort of, uh, you know, ossification or evidence of, uh, you know, the fact that this that the ideology is not dynamic, which means, you know, that it's not tied to material reality anymore. That it's become a religion, uh, you know, more of a religion than a, uh, you know, than a way of understanding a living dynamic material world. So um, he, he and I, when we, when we speak, I interview him maybe once a month and I got to hang out with him for an afternoon in Moscow last summer. Um, this is what we kick around. And so when I turned it on last night and I saw uh, the, the conversation with Vivian, I, I was, oh, and I was gushing the whole time that they were having it. So it was good. It's very, and, and there's such a diversity of opinion of, of people that are here which is something that I think is a strength to a movement that would, you know, have change. Um, and, and it's something that this, you know, ultra liberal ideology, as he calls it, too many people on our side, supposedly hold to that. No, you can't do this and you can't do that. In my opinion, for example, um, if I'm in London and if in fact they're going to come cart Julian away, and if I'm going to organize people to stop it, if I find people who are pro-Brexit and I find people who are stay people and they all want to come down and help us rescue Julian, I'm not putting a, an ideological test on who's allowed to help. Okay, because that's how you lose. The enemy wants you to divide your forces. You want to unify your forces and divide the enemy's forces. That's if you want to win. That's how you win. So... I'm looking across the spectrum of people who are, you know, doing this effort here that you've put together. This is remarkable that you got this together so quickly because I know we've been sort of in a maintenance mode uh, for the last few months. Um, and this, you know, you can see represented um, a, a whole uh, palette of uh, ideological trends, uh, all uh, in complete agreement on the task at hand, which is to defend Julian. Um, and our right to know from the United States government, which is in essence the uh, key motivator here. Well, you're talking my language, totally talking my language. Um, I always take it back to occupying the 99%. The 99% didn't exclude anyone except the elite, you know, most elite echelon of social class and financial class. Right. It was the That's 99% right. against the 1%. It wasn't the 40% against the 40% against the 15% against the 5%. That's right. And, um, and that was the strength of the Occupy movement. That was how we got 2,000 cities in, in two weeks. That was how we, had, we manifested in such overwhelming numbers that it put the shits up the elite in a major, major way. Yep. And it was precisely that everybody was welcome. Homeless, yeah. not homeless, doesn't matter. Left wing, right wing, doesn't matter. Environmentalist, libertarian, doesn't matter. Everybody is welcome because everybody is being afflicted by the same problems and the same social. Those conditions. guys have our stuff. Let's get them. You know? Exactly. That's all. Yeah. Those guys have our stuff. <laughs> exactly. Those guys. Yeah. And it was it was a highlight for me actually last night seeing Tears Rose uh, Fikra from Gion Journal, um, very left wing, hard left wing, uh, being interviewed by Vivian Kubrick, Trump supporter, mega supporter, and you know what? They got on great. They got on <laughs> wonderfully. They yep. they had the time of their lives. And that's yep. the thing. It, it, one thing that I um, can't stand is seeing activists and activist movements mimic police, policing each other, policing each other's behaviours, each other's ideological boundaries, becoming like a little court of justice, you know. And you see that um, I've seen multiple movements, I've seen those tactics be used to fracture movements where you start off a movement and you are, your focus is external, you're looking outside at the world, at the problems that are in the world, and right. then all, all it takes is a few lists of rules and, and lists of processes being established. And next thing you know, 
your personnel and resources are being expended on policing each other and right. looking internally and examining yeah. each other and deciding yeah. who's worthy and who's not worthy and what you right. know what we should or shouldn't be doing. And I've seen I've seen that process of devolution of of movements that had at its at its core really good aims, really solid aims. Um, and it's so clear to me that those tactics are deliberate. That it, it yeah. is a deliberate, as you said, to divide and conquer, <laughs> to weaken uh, weaken the movements. And I think yeah. that Unity for J is a great example where we have showed that when you don't allow yourself to be fractured by ideology that you become a more potent and a stronger force for it. Um, yeah. And it's brilliant. It's yeah. in many ways, it's been like our anonymity cloak, like our, our special device to protect us has been that That's solidarity true. across and you're across ideologies. And you're completely correct using the Brexit example. We just a short time ago, I interviewed Emmy Butlin, who is one of the vigil organizers outside the uh, Ecuadorian embassy in London. And she said they took a bunch of flyers and leaflets and they went to the remain slash leave Brexit protest. And she said that um, people on both sides wanted the leaflets and wanted to know about Julian. The pro-Brexit and the anti-Brexit people were both engaged in wanting, you know, wanting to protect free speech, yep. wanting to um, believing in the public right to know and wanting to protect our freedom um, to information. And she said that you know this it's not an ex, it's not an exclusive issue, it's a universal issue. You know, I'm sitting here in New York, in Austin, New York, by the way, um, and uh, in the United States, where among everyone left of uh, you know the charts themselves left of the Republican Party. Donald Trump is public enemy number one. And with the exception of some actual leftists who have an, you know, the remains in any event of a Marxist analysis of uh, things, um, outside of that, that small group, I would say, um, uh, the bulk of the left consider that uh, Donald Trump is uh, Putin's stooge. Um, and they point to uh, some very minor efforts by some Russians that sort of looked like they were trying to lift the uh, campaign, Trump's campaign, the little couple of thousand dollars worth of spending on ads and Facebook, stuff like that. Now, they say that because of that, Trump owes his presidency to Putin and therefore, um, you know, he basically can't be trusted to be president. So, meanwhile, WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks had a big hand, I'm sure, in suppressing some of the vote for Clinton, maybe turning some of it, and dampening enthusiasm for sure. When people saw just how absolutely crooked the DNC and the Clintons were. No one says, though, you got to watch out for Trump. Trump is going to let Julian Assange go. It's going to make him Secretary of State, you know, whatever crazy nonsense. They're doing that. The only reason I'm pointing that out is it's kind of weird because the logic of the argument that he's Putin's puppet rests on a much smaller set of facts in terms of contributing to his election than WikiLeaks could arguably be said to be responsible for. I mean, WikiLeaks just releases a bunch of stuff. If the other one side has a, a is very crooked and that's exposed by this bunch of stuff, then, then there's an impact. I mean, we're not supposed to, as journalists, try to impact an election or try to not impact an election. We're supposed to get a bunch of facts that we can dig up and say here. Now that they, they used to do that, even though they would do it selectively with a clear intent, but hopefully not the fingerprints of influencing the election. The influencing was supposed to be done in an editorial page or in columns that were opinion columns. But the rest was supposed to be just reportage of news. Here's a set of facts that we learned yesterday, or here's an event that took place yesterday, or here's uh, a vote that took place that's you know, planning an event for next Tuesday, that kind of stuff. That's what was supposed to be in the, in the news. So suddenly in the news, you have people you know, saying, 
call this one, well, Trump is a liar, so we can't do this, or, you know, Clinton did that, and blah, blah. In other words, the opinion stuff moved to where the news was supposed to be. And then you have people like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks that are reporting raw facts. They just get stuff and publish it. They don't put their hands on it other than to you know move it through a scanner or whatever mechanisms are required for, for publishing what was handed into the office. So um, when the, and when that happens, this massive you know set of misdeeds was exposed in this particular case. The logic of uh, you know Putin being the boss and uh, Trump being the uh, agent would follow if you applied it should have Julian Assange as basically the puppeteer behind the White House. So maybe he can get Trump to, you know, okay, look, pardon me, you know, pardon me. <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to play with that. It occurred to me a couple of times. I haven't developed it. <laughs> but it's true. The logic is, is, is inconsistent. Trump has been so hostile towards Russia in terms of sanctions, in terms of destroying the various okay. um, armament agreements in terms of continuing provocations on the international stage, in terms of Venezuela now, previously, yeah. Ukraine, well, yeah. continuously, Ukraine is a better way to put it, um, and yeah. in Syria, and the list just goes on and on. So it defies logic. It's just laugh it's laughable. And, yeah. you know, it, it just occurred to me as you're talking about Hillary Clinton's crimes that um, Hillary Clinton and the DMC, DNC uh, blamed WikiLeaks for their own scandal, their own uh, scandal that was caused by Hillary Clinton's right. own own actions, and that's exactly the same tactic that Lenin Moreno tried this week by blaming yeah. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for the INA Papers scandal. But interestingly, we got a completely different result, and that's we it, got that is it. It. yeah, and we got it in a much uh, shorter time frame as well. So inside of what three days Lena Moreno has discovered that by attempting to deflect onto Julian and WikiLeaks which are international figures that right. his very limited domestic scandal has turned into an international scandal of epic proportions it didn't just get legs it got wings <laughs> <laughs> exactly no. yep. exactly so and our um, an independent journalist, uh, Jose Rivera, who joins us quite regularly on these vigils, was saying today that he thinks that whoever Moreno's advisor was that told him to blame the scandal on WikiLeaks will be getting fired in short order. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, you go into politics and play all those dirty games. I mean, Lenny Moreno, since it's such a disappointment. The people of, of, of Ecuador elected him to continue the, you know, the, the work that was being done under uh, President Correa for the previous uh, two terms, I think he held, um, or three, two, I think. Um, you know, part of the uh, whole ALBA uh, grouping, uh, you know, the, the Chavez project, basically, of um, uh, trying to unify um, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean um, in terms of uh, self-defense of their sovereignty, uh, the integration of uh, their economies uh, in mutually beneficial ways, um, uh, development, um, the self-improvement, um, you know, using the uh, common resources of this very wealthy part of the world um, and the very talented 600 million people that live there uh, to uplift them because they have suffered the, the ravages of colonialism um, you know, <laughs> you've got two places that really saw, well, that's not true, but you could look around the globe and see the ravages of colonialism. I was about to completely omit Australia, for example, realizing now, of course, uh, that you wouldn't let me get away with that because you're familiar with it. They did this to in the Americas, they did it in Africa, they did it uh, in, what is that, Oceania, is that what they call it? Oceania, um, yeah, absolutely. They did it in New Zealand, in my home, yeah. my home country. Yeah, and and Asia too. And so you know, the pushback has uh, begun, and particularly the one that uh, 
you know, kind of crested in the aftermath of the triumphalism in the early 90s that we won the Cold War, we won the Cold War, we can do what we want now, you know, that's kind of over. Um, China has, is not only rising, China has risen. Um, Russia is standing uh, next to China with its uh, hand in here um, as uh, part of the defense and rising on its own. Um, for example, when uh, the U.S. sends a spacecraft into uh, orbit, it is uh, on the back of a Russian uh, booster rocket. <laughs> There's a lot of examples of that now. I, I, you, you know what Moscow is like. I was in Moscow in 1990, and then this past summer, like massive changes in terms of improvements of the, the city, just how much construction and, um, my God. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a future city, you know, only that. It's an amazing uh, change. Um, I'll tell you this, what, Moscow, sorry to interject, but Moscow and Russia do have one thing in common with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, and that's that when you come to know them and experience them firsthand, you discover they are absolutely nothing like what yeah. is said or reported about them. There no is kidding. no resemblance. No kidding. You know, <laughs> that's absolutely true. Um, and, 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 and that's the point. And that's the function that WikiLeaks and, and, and people like that uh, performs. And, and, and people like a lot of the people that you've had on already and that are going to be on over the next uh, 24 or however many more hours you got. Um, so I guess uh, uh, 48 or 36 hours, whatever. These are all people like, like Joe Laurie. I see every time I look at consortiumnews.com, I can like imagine in my eyes the red in the bottom of his eyes from staying up, excuse me, for the last three days to put the latest edition of this together with all of the stuff that's in there and all of the work that goes into editing and things. All of everybody's work involved in this. I see the missives from you keeping this thing, you know, on the burner, and so I was like, okay, time to fire it up, you know, and uh, it lit right up on time last night and uh, <laughs> you know, there are lots of people that think that having a free flow of accurate information is essential. It's the lifeblood of human society and that are willing to roll up their sleeves and do it. And, and Julian is, you know, among the group, but he's the guy that's got a gun at his head. Now they've done some remarkable things that, you know, that are out of scale to what a lot of the rest of us do on a daily basis. That's, Fine. He's persisting in doing it with a gun to his head. I mean, it would be nothing for him to go into Langley and say, all right, look, tell me who you want me to target. I'm going to put WikiLeaks imprimatur on it. We'll be able to get him. It'll look clean, you know, okay? And uh, give me a, a little, a few shekels with this too. And make a deal. He could do it like that tomorrow. Instead, he's holed up in this embassy for how many years now? You know, you wonder if they're going to turn off the shower. They turn off the internet. They screw with them. They're playing psychological warfare. Come on. Yeah, well, it seems that now they're even playing psychological warfare in terms of are they going to kick him out any moment? Oh, no, they're yeah. not. Are they going to kick him out? Oh, no, they're not. Are they going to kick him out? Oh, no, they're not. And, you know, it's almost become like this, this kind of cat and mouse thing going on. Um, it's really frustrating. And well, every time that they threaten him, then all of us, as you were just describing, we all jump on board and get sure. stuff done. I mean, yeah, I sent my share of emails and tweets in the last 48 hours, but it was people all around the world that made that hashtag trend. It was well, we, people listening and caring and sharing that made that hashtag trend. Yeah, that was you remarkable. Know, and, and, and what we got to do, everyone that sees this, Whatever you did for this weekend, on the next one, if it happens, literally, take a look at exactly what you did and do twice as much. Because each time they do this, we got to scale up our response. And the next one has to be big enough that they have to be afraid of triggering that rather than wanting to do it because, oh, my God, this will be the last chance we get. This is the last chance they had, and it's over. The yellow, uh, uh, what do they call yellow it? The yellow red. Yeah, the yellow vests are already uh, on the scene now. <laughs> Ask Macron what that means, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, tell me about it. And I mean, I'm just disgusted. France is another whole topic. I could sit here and rent for hours about it. I'm so angry. I'm so angry when I see in a so-called democracy and a so-called Western ally, you know, the military being deployed. It's like Ferguson or something all over again there. It's just, yep. it's so it's, blatant. It's just, it's just absolutely despicable. Imagine and, and, you Maduro. Know, Imagine if Maduro yeah. did that. I mean, oh, they're ready to course. invade if he, if he issues a oh, parking course. ticket. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah. no problem. Um, I think we have to wrap it now. Uh, okay. Next, I'm with Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Thank you so much, Don. Sorry you got in on the tail end of William Binney, who I'm always so reticent to let go was, of because he's. It's fine. Like, I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed listening to him, so it's fine. And hey, you guys, yeah. tell them I said hey too. All right, thanks, Don. You've been amazing. Love you very much. Thank you Love so you much. Love you too. For being here. Take care. See you.